He had been interested in one question for a very long time. Why were the main characters in novels given the most difficult tasks, and they overcame them with ease? The hero always has some kind of goal in front of him. To achieve it is the main task. However, failures still happen even on the path of the most dexterous character. Was it impossible to think everything through in advance? To consider all the options and methods of achieving the goal. But the enemy or rival is often stronger, and the hero has a hard time. If the enemy also has magical powers, the hero has to surrender. In such an unequal battle, an ordinary sword is a useless piece of iron. To admit defeat is an even more bitter fate, for he thought he was a hero. But one always wants to live, and the hero has to beg for mercy. But the enemy knows no mercy, he pursues other goals only he knows. The opponent was very experienced and dexterous, the hero was powerless. A small final clash and the hero is defeated finally. The cold-blooded opponent only grinned, there was not a drop of pity in him. The mortally wounded hero asked the villain why he is so experienced and so good in battle, would pick up his opponents at his level? Why attack such novices? But the villain did not enter into bickering and ended the hero's life with a single blow. The enemy stood over the defeated hero and muttered that isn't it obvious why he is doing this. A strong opponent or a newcomer to the battle, what difference does it make who to collect trophies from? And it's even more convenient to collect trophies from a dead opponent, there was no doubt in the villain's mind. A virtual reality RPG game set in a fantasy-style world. Based on an exceptional degree of freedom and has extensive world-building possibilities, the game quickly caught the attention of gamers from around the world. The game currently has tens of millions of users at a time. The game has become the best game in the world. The killer in the game was achieving the worst reputation as the main villain. A pop-up window showed his achievements. He killed another user. His villainy rating went up. His notoriety level increased. His fame is exorbitant. He is the first one to score a million points. The achievement obtained is the worst criminal in the world. He was left horrified by the information he received. When did he manage to turn into such a criminal? He began to recall how many users he had taken out of the game. And it was really a lot. About 100,000 people. It turns out he destroyed more than he needed to. He has been in the game for two years and the index has naturally increased. Damage to people from him increases. Now he is the worst criminal on the continent. Now all nations would fear him, and people would tremble at the sound of his name. He pondered, maybe making people tremble isn't such a bad thing. He pondered that he could cover his tracks after the murder. There were no witnesses anyway. At this time, the ability window activated the skill and reported that a person was detected nearby, about 50 meters away. There shouldn't have been a person here at this time. It wasn't a coincidence. It was probably a bounty hunter too. He decided to lurk and stalk this hunter. He even got curious who could it be? He had the ability to recognize people. This person turned out to be named Gu Huai. He realized that this name was unfamiliar. Apparently, he hadn't registered in the game rankings. Gu Huai was wearing traditional Korean training clothes, possessing armor and a thousand other different devices, but actually the most ordinary. Although of the weapons on Gu Huai was a long sword, it was probably a simple one too. But overall, his equipment was still lousy. Maybe that's why he got into the game without registering. Still, he smelled like some cheap stuff. I shouldn't even get my hands dirty. He had his doubts, but he decided not to mess with Gu Kwai and secretly left his observation point. He will always find someone to kill. Let's find more appetizing prey. And then he heard a voice behind him. Here, I found you! The assassin froze in place, who could discover him under protection. The assassin turned around to face Gu Huan and yelled, How could he break his stealth? Suddenly, Gu Huai chopped the assassin's sword in half with one blow of his simple sword. He couldn't believe his eyes. The assassin did not even immediately realize that along with his sword Gu Huai had cut through his stomach. The wound was fatal. He was still alive and he wondered how he had been taken by surprise and attacked, and by some Korean peasant. The assassin collapsed exhausted, but not dead yet, and was having trouble considering who might be lurking behind this strange type. Still looking vaguely at the ragged man, tried to solve this dilemma, but his strength was already leaving him. The murderer was dead. According to the rules of the game, the penalty does not apply to the opposing side. The player had a character with a high level of notoriety. This is the most dangerous criminal on the continent. He can't log out for 24 hours because of the death penalty imposed on him. The detainee was kept under supervision in prison after everything that happened. The murderer with such a high notoriety score gets various punishments, forfeits his name, and receives 1 million notoriety points. Also, if the character dies in the game, the character receives a level reduction. Also, the character loses many items he or she previously owned. The player couldn't believe until the end that his character was really finished? How could it be possible that a character so strong with a high level could die? The player couldn't stop thinking about it and got angrier and angrier. What kind of bastard could do this to his character? 
The punishment would be heavy because the killer had a level of notoriety like no other. The player pondered that he would later return to the system anyway, and he seemed to have thought of something. Yeah, the character did look pretty pathetic after being zeroed out like that. Now surely no one would be in awe of him now. The prison called the Great Guardian, where the murderer was kept, was located on a high cliff, a hundred meters above ground level. His sins were so numerous that the longest scroll would not suffice to list them. The Empire of Runes deprived such criminals of their rights. He was too dangerous a criminal and had no right to even a trial in defense. The sentence was unequivocal. At first, he just laughed. The Empire had sentenced him to life imprisonment. The murderer demanded at least one more chance for reform. Then he began to realize the sentence and gradually became horrified. It's a whole life in prison. It's not funny at all. Immediately after the sentencing, he physically began to feel his high level reset to zero. All abilities shut down and all his belongings confiscated. All levels passed are isolated. Strength achievements are also reset to zero. He too broke all the rules unknowingly, and this only aggravates his guilt. The condemned man was still raging in his cell for a long time, outraged and demanding justice. The poor guard standing outside his cell was stunned by his cries. Tired of shouting and demanding, the convict fell on the stone floor of the cell. He thought with hatred that it was all about the damn game. Obviously, mistakes had crept into it. He pondered the need to get out of this game somehow. Things had gone too far. Then some object caught his eye, but he couldn't make it out in the gloom of the camera. But as soon as he touched it, he realized it was a human bone and threw it aside. The bone flew to the opposite wall and fell into some pile of rags. He didn't realize at first what could be piled up there. It was a cell. Then he looked closer and saw that under the hood he could see the outline of a human skull. It's a skeleton wrapped in a cloak. Whose would it be? Obviously someone once sentenced to life imprisonment like him. Great company, thought the killer. Taking a closer look, he saw that the skeleton had some kind of curled paper clamped in its jaw. He unfolded the paper and began to read what it said was Zhao Wang's will. Yao Wang had written about himself that he was darker and deeper than anyone else. At one time, he was the Lord of Shadows and ruled the Dark Valley, and was the king of all bandits. The other rulers of the continent, the ten remaining kingdoms, treated Yawanga as an annoying pain in the ass. They must have been jealous of Yawanga, of the treasures he possessed. So they blamed him for all the atrocities. Supposedly, he had attempted on the whole continent. So the heroes of the Ten Kingdoms robbed him and put him in this prison? He saw a narrow inscription at the bottom of the will, but he could read it. It said that Yawange would repay them in the same way. He discarded the sheet as unnecessary. How was Yawange going to get his revenge if he was now lying in his cell as a pile of bones? This will of Yawange's was bullshit, the new convict decided. But then he turned around, and the sheet with the will exuded an incredible glow. And the will revealed its true meaning. It was about a successor who would come and trample their world. The meaning of his existence would be this. He would take everything away from them and leave behind only emptiness. He stood in a daze and bewilderment. What was this strange message? How was it to be understood? Yavang was the lord of the Dark Valley, unjustly imprisoned, who died alone. He hoped that a descendant would surely appear and who would avenge all his wrongs. In dying, he sealed his power in his will. Perhaps the new prisoner is suitably qualified to have Yawang's power transmitted to him. An ability window came up asking if he was ready to follow Yavang's will. But there was also a warning that all levels, statuses, and skills would be reset, and an offer to make a choice. He thought about it and realized that it was better to pass this hidden quest than to spend his life in prison. Besides, he doesn't even need to reset anything, and so everything has already been taken away. The player sat and tried to resuscitate his character but all to no avail. The character just disappeared. The situation was strange, also does not happen. The system gave nothing out, no results from the search. There was also nothing about Javang's character. The player realized that this was his first hidden quest he was going through and wondered why this was happening now. The game item was confiscated. The levels gained were blocked. It was a stalemate. The player would just have to give it all up. The character kept wondering if he was doing the right thing by deciding to do this hidden quest. The player realized that the character had returned to the first level and getting back to the fourth level again would be difficult. But the player thought of some kind of move, he will help his character go up. And now the character sees the streets of the city, and his eyes cannot believe that it is not the walls of a prison cell. He shouted to the entire town square that he had succeeded in freeing himself. The essence of the character's initialization into Javanja's successor. If the character in Argos returns to the first level, he has two options. The first is to continue from that spot or move to the starting position. The character was excited about the chance he had and was ready to move to the starting level. He was in agreement that restarting was a waste of time. The player also realized that it was better to start improving the old character again and keep the options he wanted 
than to choose an entirely new character. Suddenly, he noticed the guardsmen walking down the street towards him and became worried. Why had they come out of there? Had it become known so soon that he had escaped? How could it be so? Could it be that after such an incredible rescue, he would be captured again? Now that's luck. But the guardsmen calmly passed by him and did not even pay attention. He looked at them puzzled and thought that it seemed to be a mistake again. Before, they would have rushed at him and tried to kill me because of my terrible reputation. But now something had obviously changed. When he looked at the status window, he realized that everything had really changed. He was Luke, the most dangerous thief. Even though his dexterity, strength, speed, and luck were only at the first level, and his faith was at a disadvantage, the notoriety was still with him, still in the million-dollar equivalent. Also puzzling was the passive information. All your accumulated misdeeds are hidden, but punishment can still be applied when they are revealed. The notoriety remained with him, still in the million-dollar equivalent, but also concealed. But at this time, a window of skill opened. He was ready to buy up everything that could be offered. Got ready to click on the skills button and check it out. Active skills were the following. You have to study what valuable items can be stolen from the target. It is important to be out of the target's sight. If the theft did not succeed immediately, the chances of committing it are less and less, so the object noticed you. If the target notices Luke, there is a good chance that he may attack while protecting his belongings. As he read these instructions, he realized that he would indeed now become a common thief. Well, it seems that there's not much choice. We need to try and turn on the search mode. He looked around every passerby in the square. The experience was interesting, but useless. Too much public, but he didn't notice anything valuable from these passers-by. The ability window opened a search, and Luke wondered if it was possible to use this for players and for NPCs. He targeted two passers-by and decided to try the new skill on them. One of the guys should definitely be a great fit for the experiment. The target was chosen, and Luke strolled by, whistling and looking casual. The window reported that a specific target had been chosen, gave the name and capabilities of this passerby. Luke understood how it worked. Luke was delighted. The window recognized that this passerby was wearing valuable clothing and valuables. Luke decided that he would take at least a glimpse of these valuable items. But then the passerby moved farther away from him, and he realized confusedly that he had lost contact with this passerby. The window explained that loss of communication happens when the target gets farther away and the search stops. Luke finally understood how it worked and was ready to explore many available targets at once. Luke walked along the streets of the city in the confidence that he was sure to come across a potential target for training. He walked along the streets and pondered the need to pick a quiet place, away from human eyes, for his first experience. When the number of servers increases, the probability of getting hit decreases. Just then, Luke noticed a sleeping drunken cook lying right on the ground. Luke realized that this was the most suitable victim for training, as there were no witnesses and the victim would not know. Luke switched on the search, and the window gave information about the selected target. Further search revealed the presence of a rusty dagger in the cook's possession, but it was not important for the purpose of search and theft. Luke activated the thief ability. The cook didn't even feel that he had been robbed. The dagger was in Luke's hands easily, without too much effort or strain. Luke was satisfied. The job was done cleanly. He had the dagger. The window reported that the theft had been successful. He had gotten the rusty dagger. His experience had increased. The level of skill and notoriety had risen. Luke was both pleased and puzzled to raise his level so much at once. Luke thought that if he continued like this, would reach the previous level easily and quickly. One could only target people as stupid as him. It wouldn't be difficult. Now we need to choose a new target. Luke was walking down the street and happened to hear a conversation between two passers-by. One was wondering, does the other have no higher level items? But the one stopped him and told him to keep his voice down. But the other realized that there were items and was delighted. Luke realized excitedly that he was lucky. Stealing top-level items was much more interesting than a rusty dagger. And most importantly, they would be useful to himself. In the game Argos, there is a system of levels according to the value of items. Starting from the normal level, there are rare, unique, heroic items, as well as legendary artifacts that exist in a single copy. Even if one item is a level higher than another, it can already be used at a higher level in the game. In addition, if the item is good, it can be sold profitably. The passersby continued to talk, and one stated that he knew the other had higher level items in the elementary village. Luke decided to follow the two in case he found out something else interesting. One passerby asked the other what he was going to do with the items. Would he use them himself or resell them? The latter replied that he would first find out how much they cost now and then decide what to do with them. The first agreed that the second had made the right judgment, and one should always be careful, and they arranged to meet. And Luke decided that at the appropriate time, he would do what he had planned. The town square was lively with a brisk trade, and one of the counters was lined up. It was a pawn shop, 
The receiver spared no one, underestimated the price. But the queue was still there. There were enough people in need. Two buddies also came and stood in line. Luke moved closer to see exactly what they had, walked the required distance and turned on the search, hoping to see these very top-level items. What was his amazement that his buddies turned out to have only junk? Even an apple stump was in his pocket. He turned to the status window to make sure there were no higher-level items. And sure enough, there was nothing but bling. But on the next option, he saw an unidentifiable item. What could it be? Curious, the window said the item could not be stolen. Luke became indignant. Why is that? Luke stood in line and was perplexed. The window clarified that some items cannot be stolen because they have not been identified. Therefore, he should first clarify what the item was himself. Luke realized that he had no choice. He had to try, so he gave the command for identification. The process started. It was slow, but the numbers were growing. The queue had already advanced to the counter itself, and the identification process was not yet over. Two buddies were arguing with the receptionist about the price, which gave them a chance to wait for the ID to load. Luke was satisfied. The identification was successful and the item was identified. He was choosing the moment when it was better to approach the one who was supposed to have the top-level item. Luke, setting up for the theft, asked him how the assessment had gone. But the man looked so puzzled. Apparently, something had gone wrong. Luke realized that he now had the valuable thing and pushed the guy away with irritation, saying that there was nothing to take up space. Can't you see how many people are waiting in line? Luke, as if out of annoyance, went completely mad calling him deaf. The appraiser twirled the dagger Luke had stolen earlier and offered to buy it. The distraught pals realized that a valuable item was missing. But how? There had been some kind of mistake, so they had to file a claim. But would it be possible to find such an item? Luke walked down the alley away from the pawn shop and was extremely pleased with himself. He decided to check how much his level of various options had increased. The ability window gave out such information that Luke couldn't believe his eyes for a long time. The player was very happy. He received such a valuable artifact, which he could not get the most terrible killer in the characters. This artifact was a bracelet of wind, the perfect item for illusory speed enhancement. Gives you attack speed and agility. That means any type of speed can be used. There are no restrictions. It's really a very valuable item. The player thought that maybe it would help him become a great swordsman. The player decided to find out the latest information, at the same time about the market prices. The news reported that recently there has been an interesting trend among the rank-and-file players. The talk is that there is a new player who only attacks rank-and-file players. The player was sure that there was just some kid who had appeared and was copying him. The news claimed that it wasn't Luke the worst assassin, but something similar. It couldn't just be a coincidence, though. Through a report, they were told that a certain bounty hunter had indeed appeared. The player recognized this bounty hunter. It was Gu Huai. Who would run this character who is also not registered in the game system? Doesn't sound like a kid. The player realized it was the same hunter who killed his previous character. Need to figure out who is behind this, the killing was clearly premeditated. The player was angry and promised to deal with the scumbag who had started it. There was a meeting of the guild of 10 Argos Masters. They were deciding on the latest news. Everyone was very aggressive and didn't understand where that bastard named Gu Huai had come from and where he was from. Some tried to find some information about him but there was no information at all. Others wondered why he wasn't officially registered, and at such an inopportune time, they decided that they should deal with him as soon as possible. But the question arose, how could he be caught? One of the masters reminded them not to forget, Gu Hai is very similar to Luke, his victim, but no one wanted to even bring up Luke, the worst killer ever. Compared to Luke, this new Gu Hai is an angel. Finally, the most prudent one called for calm. It was the head of the Goblin Guild Rishner, he said that for the sake of their cause, it is necessary to calm down. If you remember how Luke felt the approach of something strange and was not even surprised, although it was a simple bounty hunter in the cheapest equipment, it becomes clear there is indeed something similar between them. Luke was walking down the street and realized that it seemed to be time to start from scratch again, but he immediately decided to put it aside and scan another passerby. After approaching the necessary distance, he intended to take all of his belongings. The window gave a new statistic that the theft was successful, Skill and experience levels increased, as did the level of notoriety. Luke was satisfied enough to move on, but thought it would be a good idea to check his status as well. He activated the status window again and thought, this is a very handy tool. Stamina, speed, strength, and abilities had all increased. Luck was not bad either, but what about trust was unclear. It was impossible to believe, but he had reached level 4 in just two days. At this rate, he could reach level 10 in just a week. His enthusiasm was interrupted by a gruff voice. Luke started to turn around. Who could it be? He saw two hulking men in armor and swords. They cheekily asked for a moment. 
Luke didn't say anything back, so they accused him of being impolite. One suggested that his buddy had scared the boy, and both of them fairly gritted their teeth. One decided to reassure Luke by saying they were kind people. One also continued by saying that they're kind of in a tough spot in this town, and suggested that they team up and work together. But Luke turned around and walked away from them, thinking that he definitely shouldn't team up with such a rabble. And why should he? But then a status window popped up and gave the information that this is a random and unexpected test. It is necessary to deal with the city hooligans. Luke thought it was worth a try and there would be a reward for it. At the same time, it will reduce the number of local thugs. Luke turned to them and said that he didn't even want to talk to such bastards as they were, much less go to work. He proceeded to reprimand them, calling them city bottom dwellers, and the city and its inhabitants have only one loss from them, and went on to say that such petty but pesky bandits should be got rid of. One of them became enraged at such accusations and attacked Luke with one purpose, to kill him. But the wind bracelet that Luke had on him gave him incredible acceleration. Luke easily dodged the sword attack and deftly tripped the thug. The thug was so bulky that he completely failed to coordinate, tripping over Luke's foot and flying over his own head. The sword flew out of the bully's hands as he fell and bounced far to the side. The bandit still angry, but now in addition humiliated by such a fall, hissed with hatred and insulted Luke. Luke decided not to tolerate the insults and roughed up the bully. He pinned the thug's head to the ground with his foot, realizing that this was even more humiliating than the previous fall. Luke openly mocked the bandit who now could say nothing. It all happened so quickly that the second bandit only just came to his senses. The second yelled at Luke for taking his foot off his friend's head. Luke glared at him menacingly and asked again, was he sure about that? continuing to crush his mate's head, giving him a mocking look. Without removing his foot from the bandit's head, Luke picked up his sword, dropped by him as he fell. Luke felt that this was the moment, the moment of triumph. Now was the moment when he felt real emotion. He realized that this moment was perfect for the return of the old Luke, the most terrible and dangerous criminal. Luke had no doubts and not a moment's hesitation. He plunged his sword absolutely ruthlessly into the bandit's neck. There was no pity in him, and not a drop of mercy even crept into his heart. The status window responded with an increase in ability level. The second bandit was terrified of this seemingly harmless fellow and did not even try to escape. But Luke was unstoppable. The desire to return to his former status of a criminal possessed him. The bandit persuaded him not to approach him, but he knew it was useless. But Luke was already seized by a maniacal lust for murder. There was no stopping him. The old Luke had awakened in him. The status window sent Luke to the house of Hamilton's town chief for his reward. Since the task of ridding the city of bandits had been accomplished, a reward awaited him. Luke calmly went to the chief's house, confident that everything would go properly because he had completed the task. The guards at the gate blocked his entrance to the house. They announced that it was the house of Hamilton, the chief of the town, and unless Luke has a prior appointment, he will not pass. Luke stated to them that he had just dealt with two town thugs and the guards could go and see for themselves. The guards hesitated. Is this true? Luke said that if they didn't believe him, why don't they go to one alley by the alley and see for themselves? The guards said it seemed to be true and decided to let him in and give a full report to Chief Hamilton himself. Luke knocked on the door and apologized for the disturbance. Luke knocked on the door and apologized for the disturbance. But on the face of it, Chief Hamilton turned out to be quite a cordial old man who simply asked what brought Luke to him. Luke recalled that there were unflattering rumors about Hamilton, and looking at him, he was just an ordinary old man. In the game, Hamilton's house is inaccessible for no particular reason. Most players have not seen this NPC character. Luke comes to the chief because he wants to report back on how he dealt with the two troublemakers in town. The chief replied that it was a pleasure to have Luke do it personally and invited him to follow him. The chief suggested to sit down at the table. He was about to make tea. Luke began to refuse as he had only come for the reward. The chief was worried about leaving so quickly, he offered to have a chat because he likes to chat so much. He just clung to Luke's hands, saying that old people really do have their quirks. Luke was shocked and didn't expect that such an old man could have such strong hands, and had to agree. And the chief, with the most pleasing, well, simply cat-like expression of his face, began to pour tea. But Luke said that a cup of tea sounded good. But what about the reward? The chief chuckled and insisted on tasting this tea first. It was the most wonderful tea leaves. Luke was getting more and more annoyed. The old man didn't seem to want to understand what Luke was asking him. And he realized that unless he had tea with the chief, he wouldn't get anywhere sooner. At least the tea was good. While drinking tea, Luke imagined such a chest with the most valuable artifacts. Finally, the chief pulled out this chest of rewards and offered Luke a choice of any item. At the sight of such abundance, Luke only opened his mouth. And besides, it looked exactly as he had imagined. Luke reached for the trunk like a mesmerized man and mouthed 
that he couldn't believe how the chief was willing to offer such rewards. Chief Hamilton is definitely the most wonderful of all chiefs. But just as Luke dared to touch some of the treasures, Hamilton stopped him by grabbing his arm. Chief Hamilton immediately turned from a good-natured old man into the likeness of an old devil. Luke even groaned. Why was he mocking him? But the grandfather was absolutely serious. He had said that the reward was only one item, so it was one. Luke was furious, the old devil. He took a tease and now he's got to pick just one. Luke also realized that he couldn't even steal them. Such artifacts with search capabilities could not be stolen. Then he suggested to the chief to test the artifacts for quality, to go out and see them in action. Chief Hamilton quietly agreed since it was just a matter of checking. Luke doubted which item would serve him better and be of any use at all. He decided to scan the objects with his eyes and not in vain. Only one was actually valuable. The object was a strange-looking box or case, probably containing something. The status window showed that Luke had chosen the item belonging to the Shadow King. Luke immediately remembered Yawang. But how could he have ended up here? In a chest with all sorts of mediocre things just pretending to be called artifacts. The status window reported that the item resurrects memories stored within it. A certain silhouette appeared, sitting in a strange pose. He was examining this strange box. The silhouette was muttering while looking at the box that it was strange to him, for he had collected all the treasures of the world, but he was encountering this object for the first time. The object enables the owner of this thing to satisfy his desires endlessly. The object turns out to be a compass. It points the direction to the owner where to satisfy his desire. And the silhouette grinned and said that this compass would become part of his new collection. As if from afar, Luke heard Chief Hamilton's voice calling to him. Luke didn't realize what was wrong with him. What was that vision? A silhouette that looked like Javong? The chief worriedly asked what was wrong with him, and Luke tried to come to his senses, shaking his head. Luke learned from the ability window that the Shadow King was gathering a collection of treasures and leaving his emblem on them. He has inherited the Shadow King's power, but Luke is too weak to use it. We need to collect the treasures scattered around the world, and it will be possible to use this power. Luke looked at the status window and resented not getting any upgrades. You can only level up and unlock abilities if you collect treasures. Luke can see the king's emblem on these items. Some items reveal the memories stored in them. The compass Luke held also indicated the owner. Chief Hamilton was surprised that Luke chose a broken compass. Apparently, Luke really is a unique person, the chief smirked. Luke was taken aback, but realized that he would no longer be given the opportunity to choose any other award. Luke was furious. He thought it was the unfortunate Shadow King along with the status window that had tricked him. The eternal compass, left behind by the adventurer who was forever chasing a dream, turned out to be broken for some reason. Luke thought feverishly, needing a way for the chief to give at least one more opportunity to choose a reward. Luke asked to wait a moment, because a broken item couldn't be a reward, could it? He asked the chief to let him pick another item. Chief Hamilton questioned if Luke was asking him to try to pick one more item and hesitated. The chief made such a menacing face, you don't even expect that from an old man, and turned Luke down. Luke, taking in what he had heard, lost all hope of persuading the chief. The chief went on to say that it was his job to refuse award applicants to choose a subject repeatedly. Luke grabbed his tea glass in despair, realized it was a failure. Luke saw a call to the chief that he would then just drink some more tea, which was really good. The chief excitedly thanked him for the compliment. Luke saw in the status box that the chief's thanks had increased the level of favor. Luke only hummed. What an achievement too, and what to do with this favor. Chief Hamilton began to put the items back into the chest. Luke watched carefully and regretted for the umpteenth time that they could not be stolen. Luke mentally questioned to the chief that did the old man really think Luke would settle for this broken compass? In vain, and activated his visual search ability and directed his gaze at the chief. Hamilton seemed to tease, examining defiantly in front of Luke the awards. The search ended with the status window showing that Hamilton had the vault key on his chest. Luke thought for a moment, and a plan of action quickly formed in his head. The player was puzzled by his character's behavior as if he kept burrowing out of control. The player's phone rang. He wasn't expecting a call. Who could it be? It was Mira, the younger sister, calling. The player became alarmed. Perhaps something was wrong. The player picked up the phone, said hello, and asked how he was doing. Said he was busy right now and asked to call later. Mira was indignant. What was the player up to and what was he so busy about? He said she was his sweet little sister and so hadn't called him, her brother, in a long time. The player tried to be ironic. He said he was just kidding. Did she have some business with him? She replied that it was nothing special. Just maybe he would come to see her this month. And also said that her mom misses her a lot and she little sister misses her too. The player said he understood and would think about the suggestion. The sister persisted and told him not just to think about it, but to take it and come and hung up. The player frustrated hung up the phone and realized that he needed to visit his family 
It gave him a headache. He was angry because the real headache was from this Chief Hamilton and his key. It wouldn't be hard to steal the key, but the fact that the Chief never leaves his house makes it harder. The player's head was just smoking because he was getting frustrated at not finding a solution. At this time, a co-worker came over and offered the player a drink. Maybe he would feel better. She asked what had alarmed him so much. It was evident from his condition that something had happened. The player thanked and said he didn't want to talk about it. She wouldn't understand anyway. She said that she sees everything, that he is very unrestrained. If the game is not going, we need to look at it from the other side. The player didn't understand what she meant and couldn't tell her so she would understand. She offered to give up the game and he resented that she didn't know what she was talking about. But she understood perfectly well and said there was a simple way. You had to create a situation so that Chief Hamilton would have no choice but to leave his house. Maybe set a trap or something like that. He thought about her suggestion. Maybe she's right and this is just the right solution. Why hadn't he thought of it before? He asked her for a device to play with. She was taken aback. Really right now. The player said that he seemed to have found the solution to this riddle, thanked her, and promised that he would not be indebted to her. He quickly got ready to leave, and all she said was that she hoped to hear about what happened in Argos later. A colleague realized that the player had caught on to the idea and should be able to handle it. He realized that he really had no choice but to create a situation to lure the chief out of the house. The upside would be that it would be safe to enter Chief Hamilton's house at this time. The player feverishly began to work on creating the situation. If all goes well, Chief Hamilton will definitely be robbed. A few hours later, at the home of the village headman of the newcomers, Chief Hamilton, with a confident stride, Luke approached the gate of Chief Hamilton's house. The guards at the gate recognized Luke, and he walked boldly toward the gate, quite satisfied. The guards calmly led him through and told him that Chief Hamilton was waiting for him. Luke replied that he knew that. An overjoyed Luke went inside greeting the chief, expecting a good reception. Chief Hamilton welcomed Luke, greeted him, and almost enclosed him in a hug. Luke, already sitting at the table, asked for some delicious tea, as he was very tired. He can't forget the taste of the tea the chief gave him. Satisfied with his praise, the chief asked him to wait a bit. He would make the tea very quickly. Luke insisted that there was no need to hurry at all. He would wait as long as necessary. Luke activated the target search and talked to himself to get Hamilton to just move slower, and everything worked out perfectly. The key theft was a success. Luke was now the owner of the key. Now that he was in possession of the key, he could get down to business. The chief served the tea. Luke thanked him, but he only thought about the fact that the safe was somewhere to the left. Luke surveyed the first floor room with an active eye, but found nothing suitable for a safe. There was only one place left. The only place Luke did not survey was the second floor. Luke sat and complimented Hamilton on what a wonderful tea Hamilton could make, and the chief only squinted with pleasure. The status window showed that Chief Hamilton was very pleased with the compliments. The favorability rating increased, and Luke was just waiting for the chief to leave the house already so he could get down to business. Finally, they heard a knock on the door. The chief got worried and apologized so he could leave to open the door. Luke was only too glad and assured him that everything was fine. The chief opened the door and there stood a huge man. Hamilton asked him, Is he the blacksmith Hewton? The blacksmith confirmed that it was him Hewton and said that there was a problem with the drain and it would be better for Hamilton himself to look at the problem. Hamilton interjected that does it really have to go and look at the problem right now? Smith responded that it looks like it's all tightly packed with dirt in there. He would need to look at it in person. Hamilton thought for a moment, remembering where he had seen dirt recently. He turned to Luke and remembered seeing mud on his shoes. And sure enough, all of Luke's shoes were covered in mud. It was all very suspicious. Hamilton did have some doubt, even suspicion. Something was not right here. But the chief decided to go out to see what was wrong and asked Luke to wait. He was leaving for a while and Luke asked him to wait here. Luke assured him not to worry, he would wait. Luke was happy to see the chief off and was ready to proceed with the plan. Luke was pleased with himself. It was a great idea to clog the pipe with dirt. Luke went up to the second floor and expected to have the whole inspection done within 10 minutes. He should find everything he needed very quickly. He went up the stairs very excited and felt like a real treasure hunter. Luke doesn't seem to have the wrong room. It should be Chief Hamilton's room. Being already in the room, Luke tried to determine where this old man might have a hiding place or something like that. Luke looked around searching, realizing he didn't have much time at all. Suddenly, he noticed some sort of door to the roof. He got curious. What's it for? Luke decided he had to check it out before Hamilton came back. And then he heard heavy footsteps on the first floor. What bad timing. It was the guards who had come to check on him, evidently on Chief Hamilton's orders. Luke looked out of the room and wondered if Hamilton had guessed something and decided to use his guards. They shouted Luke's name, trying to see if he was here. The guards were talking amongst themselves, not understanding why Chief Hamilton had ordered them to search the house. Going up to the second floor, they condemned the incomprehensible order to find Luke and were perplexed. 
Who needs this boy? Luke heard that they were going up to the second floor, returned to Hamilton's room, and feverishly thought out, where could he hide? The guards murmured from the stairs and called out to Luke. Was he on the second floor or not? They went into Hamilton's room and called for Luke, suggesting that he might be lost in the house and had wandered in by mistake. The guards looked around the room but didn't see anything suspicious. Luke sat in his makeshift hiding place, afraid to breathe, just to avoid giving away his presence in the room. The guard called out to Luke again in case he was here and they couldn't see him. Luke sat in his improvised hiding place, wondering when they would leave. The guards decided to check the closet. This guy must be somewhere. Luke was already begging from his hiding place for them to leave and not come back. One of the guards checked in the closet. Need to check everywhere. The guards slammed the door shut, realizing that the search was futile and pointless. Finally, they left Hamilton's room without finding Luke. Luke heard the guards come out and began to climb out of his hiding place. The hiding place wasn't the most elaborate, but once out, Luke breathed a sigh of relief. Luke went straight for the top door in the ceiling. It was his last chance. The door had a secret. It had a ladder to the top. Luke had never seen such a thing. It wasn't bad. Luke had just climbed those stairs. He saw what he wanted to see. Luke saw that he had not tried in vain to get the old chief out of the house. The covenant chest shone with such appeal. The treasure stored in it surely deserved such a vault. Absolutely satisfied, Luke reached his destination. His eyes lit up in anticipation. Luke took out the key to the chest and mouthed that now only he would own all these rewards. He inserted the key into the keyhole, imagining how many valuable items were in there. How glad he was to take possession of the chest, imagining different pictures to himself. What disappointment overtook him at first, having expended so much effort to get some junk. But then Luke realized that this was the armor for a first-class hunter. From the shirt to the boots. All the gear is so worthy, he'll take it all with him. Luke pulled a roll out of the chest as well. It was a map. He thought it was just the right new challenge. Great, he would do well to pull up his levels. The player was pleased. He had done well. Gave a little push for the character to progress a bit in the hidden scenario. Appa realized that this was what it was all about. Nice move. Exactly one year ago, a new completely transparent scenario was launched in the Argos game. It was a quest dedicated to the history of the entire continent and it interested so many people. There was such a huge flow of users. The leaders were the regular rank and top 10 guilds. Most users thought they could monopolize the quests. However, such an expectation was dispelled very quickly and quite convincingly. Even the rank and file couldn't advance far enough through the stages. It was hellishly difficult. Progression was divided into dozens of levels. There are dozens of prerequisites to break through plus blocked routes. Users went to great lengths to make the main scenario go according to their plan. They spent all their time, effort, and money on it, but the result disappointed them. Unexpectedly, a hidden scenario of the whole course of the further game appeared. Everyone had to complete the tasks of the hidden scenario before realizing the main scenario. When the necessary conditions were disclosed, the ranking writers tried to monopolize everything related to the hidden scenario, and the competition has continued throughout the year until today. The player thought that the card would serve as the starting point of the hidden scenario, although this can be a very troublesome endeavor. On the map, the desired location is in the south. It is possible to cover the distance to this place by wagon. The player knew that he could always pass the task to someone else if it became too difficult. Of the most difficult challenges will be clearing the forest, a prerequisite for this quest. The player sat down at his workstation and began this quest. A wagon with a horse and a charioteer can be found at the city gate. And just the right wagon was found, and the driver also looked experienced in his work. His wagon was designed for three passengers. And then the charioteer was called out. It was a pretty young girl. She needed a place in the carriage. The charioteer asked her if she was willing to drive across to the main continent. She was willing. She had already reached the 10th level and was ready to undergo these trials. The charioteer said that this test should not be taken lightly. Is she sure she is confident in her abilities? She assured him that she was absolutely ready. He agreed and said it would be curious to see how she would get through the ordeal. He puzzled the girl, but she was determined. The wagon was designed for three. The girl was the first. We had to wait for two more passengers. The girl settled down on the passenger bench in the wagon and exhaled. The girl had a belligerent attitude. First of all, she had yet to meet the other passengers. They would have to go through the ordeal together. She was setting herself up to not be timid in the face of hardship. She is a warrior with a big heart. She remembered how hard it was for her to get to level 10, but she did it. She convinced herself to prepare only for good things and to keep only positive thoughts in her mind. At this time, another passenger appeared. The charioteer started to explain which route they would take, but the passenger stopped him, saying that there was no need to explain anything. The passenger was Luke. He stared at the girl opposite and she at him. Luke didn't expect the team member in the test to be a girl. She was also puzzled to see such a young participant. But Luke showed gallantry and greeted his companion. 
Besides, she was pretty. She was so sweetly embarrassed, but she also responded to the greeting. She was so insecure that she wondered how it was that she could say hello to this guy. Luke was absorbed in his own thoughts, thinking that he should make the most of this opportunity, though he was still overcome with anxiety. He regretted that there were no valuable items in the reward chest, but he immediately reassured himself that what was done was done. So why bother? Luke thought that he was still quite lucky. He had to make up for lost time. The status window explained that the equipment he found in the chest was an ancient hunter's kit. It increases dexterity and helps him hit his target accurately. The wagon moved on, and Luke pondered that with his small ability level, he had to walk through the entire forest of trials. In the thicket of the forest lurk all the monsters that must be gotten through. Whoever wants to get to the main continent, everyone goes through this forest of trials. As the name of the forest suggests, where ferocious monsters hide. This is the only way through the forest. All who pass through this forest meet these ferocious monsters. The only one who can guide those who wish to pass through this forest is a charioteer named Holtz Gathers. The passengers must protect Holtz and his carriage from the attacking monsters. The trials come in monstrous waves and pile up in five stages with a difficulty level that is overwhelming for level 10 users. If the participants die because the trials proved impossible, the quest starts over. Luke looked at the wind bracelets and realized that he had to think about what kind of artifact he had gotten. He needed to test it out again. He also thought that he didn't know who would be on the team with him. Would he be able to help, or would they be stronger and not have to? And having to get used to the idea of having to carry the bracelet with him at all times. Luke put the wind bracelet on himself and even admired it. It looked good. And then a third character, user Gulliver, joined them. Luke decided that this one had to be a mage. His whole appearance testified to it. Luke looked at his traveling companions and thought they looked like switched characters. He drove and hoped that his traveling companions at least didn't interfere with his trials. At this time, the charioteer commanded everyone to get off soon. They were approaching the first trial. The contestants all got ready. They were waiting for an attack from any side. But the ride was still quite long, so Luke even got bored. Luke decided to scan his traveling companions. What were they really capable of? Started with the girl, user Rabbit. Kit has acorns, glass beads, and most surprisingly, Electro. Luke was simply amazed. Among acorns and beads, there was such a property as Electro. Luke realized that he had a unique Electro dagger with him on his team. That's just crazy lucky. To have such a weapon on the team is incredible luck. But Luke also realized that this very property was at such a low level of only 2%. This 2% gives hope of victory, but it is worth failing even once. The warrior will be defeated. The status window showed Luke that if he conducts an unsuccessful heist, his level decreases. If his level drops to 0%, his actions will be considered hostile. It seems if he is attacked, he can only defend himself. If he makes a mistake, he could be labeled a criminal and end up in a fight anyway. So he needs to increase his level so he can be more useful in combat. Luke suggested that the companions get to know each other and get to know each other better because they need to become a team. He suggested that they start by introducing themselves. He said his name and asked the names of his traveling companion. One fellow traveler, a frowning large man, asked to be called Gulliver. A girl called herself Rabbit, while embarrassing herself so much that it was hard to believe she could fight. Luke began to tell his companions that he had done some research. Surely they would know something about it. The bottom line is that working well together as a team is much more successful than fighting every man for himself. Luke suggested a strategy. First, it is known that there will be five waves of monsters. The way to move is to get around the monster and stop its attack. In the first wave, the wolves will attack. The number of monsters is significant, but they do not attack all at once. This gives some advantage. Luke suggested that he and Rabbit take turns acting at the front of the attack. Colic did not expect such a suggestion and was frightened. Gulliver would cover the rear. Gulliver hesitated. Usually warriors like him just act in front of all the regular players who fight in the middle. Luke objected that if they did as usual, it wouldn't do any good since they still needed to defend the wagon. Luke clarified that if the front is protected, that will be their priority. It's necessary for the melee warriors, and such a plan should work fine. Luke said that he might not be very good at it, but also that any discomfort or misunderstanding of the situation, he would immediately orient himself. This he had already checked, Gulliver said pleased. It was good that Luke had offered at least some sort of plan. It was already a step towards victory. Rabbit also began to thank Luke for explaining everything to them taking the time to do so. Luke sincerely thanked the companions for their understanding and good words, and he thought to himself that it was so easy to fool them. Dusk had already fallen, and the wagon came to the thickest part of the forest, and then everyone, both the charioteer and his companions, noticed many ominous red eyes among the trees. It was the first wave of monsters, the wolf monsters. These beasts were quite unlike ordinary wolves. The red eyes alone spoke of the unnatural nature of these monsters. 
and the howls given off by these monster wolves, it would make even the bravest warriors dumbfounded. The horse was the first to feel the presence of the unclean power. The charioteer was not able to cope with it at once. The members of the newly formed team, no matter how prepared they were, felt the eerie presence of this unclean thing. The charioteer turned around and quickly muttered that if they couldn't pass through here, they definitely wouldn't get to the main continent, and asked very much to protect the wagon. Luke did not hesitate and rushed out of the wagon ready to face the monsters. But he did not act thoughtlessly. First, there was a moment to see the enemies. The wolves approached, assessing their prey. Luke did not look like a serious opponent at all. The status window gave information that they were not just wolves, but wild wolves of the ninth level. But both Rabbit and Gulliver were not confused and were on full alert. Luke immediately said that he would first gather all the information about the enemy himself and let Miss Rabbit stay a little behind. And the Rabbit objected that she had better go first herself. But Luke apologized and objected that Miss Rabbit was not noted for her stamina among them. If Luke went first, it would be easier for Bunny afterward and she could cover him. Luke asked Gulliver if he was ready to protect them from the rear. A solid rear will give Luke a turn at the front position. Gulliver immediately told Luke to trust him. He would do as agreed. The monster wolves were already at their limit and ready to pounce. Luke, too, had come to his most belligerent state and was just waiting for them to attack. Luke had his dagger at the ready, and a wolf that threw itself at him would not be left alive. Luke himself did not notice how the wind bracelet helped him to dodge and move with extraordinary speed. He was able to wrap himself around the wolf so quickly, and Luke could take advantage of that moment. The wolf flew quickly past Luke, and Luke was able to kick it under its abdomen in time, and in the next moment delivered a fatal blow with his dagger to its neck. The fading eye of the beast showed that the blow was indeed fatal. Luke stood over the defeated beast, and did not immediately realize how quickly the whole fight had ended. Luke turned to the rest of the wolves and muttered, happy about the first fight, what are they pulling small dogs? What are they waiting for? Not attacking. Out burst the next wolf to attack, with a clear intent to tear everyone apart. Luke shouted to Miss Rabbit that it was time to engage, and she was belligerent and rushed forward. She entered the battle very confidently, fearless and assured. The former embarrassment was gone. The first attack of the wolf was perfectly repelled by her shield, and at the same time, she pushed the beast away. Rabbit with such force gave a rebuff to the wolf that he simply flew away, without even having time to snap. But Luke decided to back up Rabbit and threw his dagger, aiming at the wolf. The dagger hit the wolf's head between the ears, and it was definitely dead. The other wolves became worried and decided to attack from the rear. But they were met with an unexpected response. Magic balls from Gulliver. Gulliver threw the balls so skillfully that no beast could approach. And then Gulliver threw a merciless stream of magic balls at the wolves. And at the front, Luke also wasted no time, managed to disarm one wolf after another. But these monster wolves seemed to be an endless number, all throwing and attacking. But the newly formed team had enough strength so far, they threw the beasts away without much effort. Another wolf was defeated. Luke was very dexterous, never once fell under his fangs, but he managed to slaughter many animals. Luke was pleased and suggested that they finish the fight. He thanked Miss Rabbit for her excellent defense and timely attack, and thanked Mr. Gulliver for a well-executed heavy defense from the rear. And Miss Rabbit and Mr. Gulliver almost simultaneously expressed their admiration for the fighting qualities of Luke himself. Gulliver could not restrain his emotions, and sincerely admitted that he could not believe how such a little puppet Luke could put down so many animals, and even so cleverly he, Gulliver will remember it for the rest of his life. Luke thought that they weren't trolls after all. He'd been worrying about that for nothing. Gulliver suggested that they be seated and go on their way. Luke asked Gulliver, puzzled, if he was sure it was time to go. Miss Rabbit asked if she was ready to keep moving on. Luke also said that he would be willing to help her on the next level. She assured that it is not necessary, and inquired if Luke had any special weapons. Luke was confused and asked again if he had understood her correctly. Bunny was confused again and asked him to ignore her questioning. Luke stopped her, and he wondered if she had guessed that he had intended to steal from her. A full analysis must be made. This Miss Rabbit is not as simple and naive as she wants to appear. When did she realize what he was trying to do? How could he have blundered? Miss Rabbit decides she's suppressing Luke by questioning him. There might be a chance to find out a little more about him later. And yet, since when does she know? And yet she doesn't say anything about suspecting anything. They all went to the wagon, and Luke wondered if there would be an opportunity to steal from Miss Rabbit. Gulliver received strange information in his status window and had only questions, like elastic bands for wounds. There are a few left. Looks like they don't have any of the inhibitions left. And even the priest won't help them now. Gulliver asked Miss Rabbit how many elastic bands she had. She said she had one. Gulliver asked if she was sure. Gulliver also said he had enough. Luke listened to their conversation in bewilderment. Luke decided to check his status window. 
He had an excess of 280 pieces of elastic tape for use when he was wounded. He figured he probably wouldn't need that much. Luke grinned slyly. Bunny said she only had one ribbon left. It would be usable sometime. Four more waves ahead and injuries would be inevitable. She'll use up her only elastic tape and it probably won't be enough. And so they got to the next wave. They were aggressive monkeys with level 10 abilities. Miss Rabbit launched an excellent attack and gave a serious fight back to one of the monkeys. She fought bravely, desperately, and selflessly, but she felt the superior strength of the monkeys. The monkeys were attacking from all sides at the same time. Rabbit would not have been able to cope, so she began to call for Luke's help. Realizing that if he didn't come to her aid, she would die. Luke yelled for Bunny to hold on. He was about to come to her rescue. He realized he had a great idea, defending the front flank one at a time. She would get wounded and use her last elastic band and he would just be able to offer his. Gulliver also began to be attacked and he used his powers, shouting out to make those monkeys tremble with his fireballs. The fireballs struck the monkeys and they fell haphazardly under this fiery attack. Miss Rabbit held the defense in every possible way as far as her strength went but her strength was running out. Such a torrent of monkeys attacked her. Gulliver also started yelling in Luke's direction. How much more time would he need? Luke fainted and stalled for time. Bunny could no longer hold her defenses alone and again called for Luke's help. And Luke again made up a reason because he wasn't fully ready yet. And the monkeys kept coming and it was as if there were only more of them. Rabbit urged Luke on, holding back and holding the defense from the last strength. The blows were harder and harder trying to hold back such an onslaught from the last strength that they had. Gulliver, while repelling the attack from the rear, yelled at Luke why he was taking so long, because Rabbit was about to die. And Luke continued to take his time, winding the elastic bands. The charioteer sitting on the wagon decided that everything on this trip seemed to have failed. The charioteer announced to them that it looked like their mission had failed. They had gone too far, and asked them to leave his wagon, these adventurers, wished them to stay alive and perhaps they would meet again. Luke resented the charioteer. It's not quite over yet. We just have to wait a little longer. Gulliver was also terribly displeased. If they left the carriage now, they would not pass the test and would have to go back to the quest from the beginning. Rabbit shouted out to them. Maybe they should stop arguing. Maybe they could help her survive. Rabbit's last desperate cry for rescue even dispersed all the birds in the neighborhood. Dawn came and the aggressive monkeys retreated, an exhausted Miss Rabbit leaning against the wagon. Miss Rabbit saw her status window. It showed that she had successfully completed the challenge. Once everyone in the trial continued on their way, the trial would continue. Gulliver and Luke looked in bewilderment at Miss Rabbit. She is in a semi-fainting state. Luke only remembered warning her once, and she dodged an apparent life-threatening threat. Luke himself managed to get a kick from one of the monkeys at the same moment. Luke decided to dodge the attack to the last. Why take such a risk? Rabbit took the main offensive. Gulliver again took the rear part of the battle. Luke thought about it. In fact, it turns out that he made her suffer so much. But his task is to rob his fellow travelers, not to show them mercy. Luke asked Gulliver what he thought of Rabbit's condition. What about her? Gulliver said that from the look of her, she definitely has a problem. Apparently, she didn't have enough elastic bandages. Miss Rabbit recovered a little and apologized because she thought they had failed the whole test. And it was she who had failed. Luke realized that he had set up the whole situation himself. He told her that it was a problem, but there were three more waves of trials to go but his previous plan was just going very coherently. Bunny began to apologize again. Luke stated that he could share with her. Miss Rabbit couldn't believe if he was really willing to share with her. Luke declared that of course they could help each other, and he would ask her to fulfill a small request for him. She agreed at once and asked what she needed to do. Luke couldn't believe his ears. How did she agree so quickly? And Miss Rabbit in turn was puzzled as to why he did not immediately accept her consent. Luke hasn't realized yet that he can't understand the logic of her behavior? What was going on? and Gulliver reveled in listening to them. Miss Rabbit honestly confessed how she felt. She was again very embarrassed. Luke looked puzzled at the elastic band and still did not understand why he was so embarrassed. The status window showed that his task now was to simply apply the bandage. From performing the task, he would receive an increase in his level. Luke coaxed Rabbit that it was just a bandage and there was no need to be embarrassed. She didn't deny but such a distance between them, but immediately thought it didn't matter. Bunny asked Luke if he was sure he only had one request. She would definitely pay him for the elastic band, but not until later. Luke laughed and assured her that it wasn't necessary. It just looked like he needed to get better at bandaging. Miss Rabbit was again embarrassed and said that Mr. Luke was very kind and thanked him. Luke laughed and replied that he didn't have to. His thief's search was activated at this time. He hadn't given up hope of stealing from her. He was grateful to her for everything too, but he himself waited to see how after every battle her level increased and her electro sword also accumulated interest. One must wait a little longer. The electro level is already 25%.
just a little more and he would possess a great weapon. Luke was dreamily contemplating his plans, and Miss Rabbit was melting from his concern. Luke cherished his scheme of stealing so much that even his face reflected this anticipation of possessing this wonderful sword from Miss Rabbit. Miss Rabbit was mortified at his kindness and thought that he seemed to be a really nice fellow and wondered if she should give him some kind of gift in return. She pushed the thought away because she figured if she gave him anything, he would think she was weird. Luke looked at her and really thought so. How weird she was after all. She decided that the right thing to do would be to work hard and do her best on the front lines of defense. Here they were approaching the fourth trial. A wave of monsters were already waiting for them. On this test, the monsters were level 11 venomous snakes. Miss Rabbit was again the first to meet the blow. The snakes instantly pounced. One of the snakes bit into her leg and all the others followed. Miss Rabbit could not dodge at all, was all bitten and began to bleed. She screamed so much from terror, pain and bleeding and could not turn around at all. The snakes were aggressive, strong, agile, leaving no chance to dodge them. She desperately called out for Luke's help, and again he delayed until the last moment. Luke was satisfied. Everything was going according to his plan. The status window showed the successful completion of the fourth wave. The contestants could return to the wagon and continue onward to the next challenge. Miss Rabbit was disheveled and collapsed exhausted right on the ground. Gulliver was extremely mortified looking at her. Gulliver was still satisfied. After all, the test had been passed. He went to the wagon and told Luke that he would not interfere with the two of them taking their time to heal their wounds. Luke thought Gulliver was leaving just in time. Miss Rabbit apologized and asked for help. Luke was pleased and reassured her. He would take care of everything. Let her please don't worry, he will apply the bandages most carefully. Luke activated his vision to search and saw that the Electro Sword already had 50% potential. It was a credit to Rabbit. Her combat ability when attacking had increased a level. He bandaged Rabbit's wounds while he pondered on how to steal from her more cleverly. It's like playing the lottery. There can only be a 1% chance. Luke was determined to steal, but something was obviously in his way, and the theft failed. The status window reported that the ability to steal had dropped to 45%. Luke was shocked by this information. How and when could this have happened? Luke was so disappointed, and the only thought going through his mind was that the theft had failed, and the electro level had dropped to 10%. Well, that was a total disappointment. Miss Rabbit thanked Luke and said she thought there were enough bandages already. Luke stopped her, asking her to stay a moment longer. She was surprised, but agreed. Luke spoke in a heartfelt way, telling her to take care of her health so she could make it through the final test. She didn't expect Luke to be so concerned and worried about her health. Luke confirmed that he was indeed concerned about her. He had thought so before, he just hadn't told her so. She excitedly extended her hand to him and offered to continue bandaging. Luke agreed and continued bandaging, and thought to himself that he only had one more chance left. The status window confirmed that the Electro Sword had reduced its potential to the 10% level. Luke tried to steal the sword again, but again he failed. On the fifth wave of challenges, the participants were awaiting wild boars of level 12. The contestants lined up according to the plan they had devised. Miss Rabbit and Luke at the front, Gulliver covering the rear and protecting the cart with the driver. Here, the first of the boars rushed to the attack. The boars were very large and powerful, Luke was ready to face the wild boar. He kept his dagger at the ready. The wind bracelet that Luke had gave him the ability to gain speed and be very maneuverable. He successfully dodged the boar. His evasion skill had reached the right level and his innate evasion skills were sharpened. Luke himself attacked the boar from behind and put his blade under its ribs. Luke pulled the blade out and blood gushed from the wound. The boar was still running by inertia. But the wound was fatal and the boar didn't last long and collapsed dead. Luke also dealt with three more boars, though it took a long time. Maybe because it was the last wave and he overestimated the danger. Then he caught a glimpse of one of the boars intending to attack Miss Rabbit from behind, and Luke shouted to her to be careful. Gulliver was also being chased by a boar. Gulliver ran and resented what an aggressive mob he had gotten, and he was not old enough to run around like that. Luke was afraid he wouldn't be able to get to Miss Rabbit in time to help her, and yelled at her to turn around so the boar wouldn't take her by surprise. Miss Rabbit heard Luke's calls and began to turn around. The boar was already very close to her. She was not expecting it and did not immediately prepare to repel the attack, but pulled herself together, mobilized, and as she thought she was ready, but in fact her strength was running out and she might not have been able to cope. Luke ran to the rescue and plunged his blade into the boar. The boar collapsed with a bloody mortal wound and Miss Rabbit was saved. Luke didn't expect this reaction of his own, but he was why he was uncomfortable with this emotion. Miss Rabbit asked how he was feeling and thanked him for saving him. Luke reassured her that he was fine. If he was in danger, because Miss Rabbit could also come to his rescue, 
he would count on it. Miss Rabbit had tears of gratitude and appreciation for Luke. Miss Rabbit assured him that she would be ready and do her best for him. Luke thought that he had at least succeeded in helping them not give up in their most difficult moments. Of the opponents, there were still two boars left. We should finish them off quickly. And Luke did not hesitate a moment longer and swung at them with the most bloodthirsty intentions. The status window gave information about successfully passing the fifth wave, as well as congratulations on successfully completing all the challenges in the forest. They had overcome the first stage to advance to the main continent. The wagon would bring them to their destination very soon. There is only a short section of the forest left. The final destination looked like a round, shining portal. Miss Rabbit exclaimed that she could see it even from this distance from the wagon. Gulliver also regarded the portal with all his eyes. And Luke just exhaled in relief. They had finally reached the finish line. It had been one hell of a ride. Gulliver started to thank Luke and said about his great skills. They were the reason they had overcome everything. Luke really did a great job. Miss Rabbit also supported Gulliver. It really was amazing. If they were as good as Luke, the whole ordeal would have gone much faster and without much loss. Gulliver said that maybe we should show these achievements to Hugh and Nim. Luke thought, would the head boss really be interested in his techniques? But he was sweetly embarrassed by such praise. Gulliver continued to make fun of Luke, called him a puffball, which is nothing like the psychotic Luke on TV. Miss Rabbit asked Gulliver who he meant. Was he referring to the guy who supposedly kills users? Gulliver confirmed that he was talking about him exactly, and that he had heard that that Luke guy had killed about 100,000 users, a real psychopath. Luke got embarrassed again. That's really bad. That's what the people around him think of him. They seem to treat him like a piece of shit. Gulliver warned Luke not to bring it on himself. Does he mean to say that he's a crazy lunatic? Miss Rabbit also began to snicker that Luke just wasn't as outgoing, but he didn't seem to smell of antisocial evil. Gulliver was having a hearty laugh too. Sounds like the truth of what she said. Luke's completely down. Looks like he's been mistaken for a buffoon before, albeit a creepy killer. The charioteer announced to his passengers, these adventurers, that they would be arriving soon. The charioteer also added that he thought they were the best adventurers he had seen, and he had seen more than a few. He praised them that they had done a great job. Luke also complimented everyone. They had come a hard way. He said he'd see them next time. He thought to himself that they were really hard to work with and it was better not to meet them ever again. Miss Rabbit, blushing and embarrassed, offered him her friendship. Gulliver frowned. For some reason, he didn't like the offer, and Luke was quite puzzled. Luke pondered this request for friendship. He could quite rightly reject it, but something stopped him. He simply said goodbye to them, and they began to dissolve before his eyes. Each reached their destination. The portal threw Luke to the outskirts of the city. He went to the next level. Luke materialized in the location of the city he needed to get to. Great portal got all the participants to where everyone needed to go. Luke stood in front of the entrance to the city and couldn't be glad he had finally gotten here. He walked contentedly toward the city and thought it was time for him to conquer the main continent. Luke walked to the market square and thought that all the markets in all the cities were similar to each other. All the merchants were yelling, praising their goods, even a tent where any contraband was bought. On the other side, there was a shout about recruiting guild members. No level restrictions, but at the age of 20. On the other side, were calling for a team of goblin assassins. No less than 30 people. Luke decided to check what was left with him after the forest adventure and took out the electric sword, safely stolen from Miss Rabbit after all. The user with this sword is like the thunder of heaven with the ability to deafen everyone around him. The status window gave the following information. The theft was successful. He received an electro sword polishing. Experience, skill, and notoriety have also increased. If you really want to, the universe will respond and help you. Luke was absolutely pleased getting such a sword, an electro-polishing sword. He walked through the square and pondered that it would be a good idea to equip himself before arriving at the place specified in the hidden scenario. It would be a good idea to find some of the items belonging to the Shadow King. Just then, a merchant approached him personally, saying that he had just what Luke needed. Luke was taken aback, as if the man had overheard his thoughts. The merchant continued rubbing his hands together that if Luke would take a moment to talk to him, he wouldn't regret it. He had a very interesting item, he assured him. Luke glanced to the status window. It showed that the user in front of him was Daiso, occupation, merchant. Daiso continued to interest Luke and offered to take a look at his wares. Luke looked at this Daiso's counter and thought that it was basically just junk. Luke squeamishly thought that these merchants were only good at baiting simpletons and that there was nothing good to be found here. 